how you first found out about the bonus marchers? I suppose I first heard about it um, in over, pre over radio or in the newspapers. Um, I was working in an office then, um, not very far from the White House, and uh, I was much interested in what was happening to these hapless people who were without jobs, without money, without anything. Um, I must have, I think I had read about the hunger marches that preceded it, but I did not follow that as closely as I did follow the bonus marchers. Um, how did you, how did you get involved with the bonus marchers? What happened that you got involved? I had a friend who was as much interested as I was in what was going on, and Every day, as soon as we were through with our jobs, around 4.30, we would jump into her car and go over to the Capitol and uh, go to wherever the bonus people were to talk with them and find out what was going on. We did this day after day. Um, now, you had said that you spent a lot of time in the camps. Uh, can you describe um, some of your, your visits to those camps? Do you have any vivid memories of that? I have some rather vivid memories, um, memories that involved horror and humor and pay, uh, pathos. Um, the people who in, lived in those camps were doing their best to live a somewhat normal life in absolutely abnormal circumstances. Um, they tried to do, give little homey touches to the hovels they lived in. I don't know where they got all the materials to build their, their little hovels. Uh, some of them were built of, of cardboard, some of um, tin sheeting, some of wood, um, and several of them, a number of them had planted little gardens, uh, put plants, uh, had bought plants to put around their places. Um, of course, after the camp at Anacostia was torn up, it was just chaos, it was set fire to. Um, I did see, at first saw the camps that they lived in on Pennsylvania Avenue, but I didn't see as much of those. The action was more around the Capitol building then. But I did go over to Anacostia when they moved over there. And so I got, I know, knew Anacostia better than the camp on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, what kind of people were in these camps? Who were they? I suppose that the people in the camps were a hodgepodge of people who normally didn't have much income but had jobs. Uh, there were some professional people. Uh, there were a good many women and a good many children because um, so many of them had had to give up their homes when they had no income. Um, they had come from all over the country, some of them in rattletrap cars. Um, I remember one family we talked to had come all the way from California in a car. They had to, their home was taken away from them, and they had put into the car everything they could carry, including the jelly the wife had put up. And they used the jelly to um, uh, pay the toll charges when they got onto a, a toll bridge or a toll road, and I remember the wife telling me so resentfully that one toll keeper had taken 12 jars of her jelly to let them go through a 50 cent toll charge. Oof. So they were, um, they were on their last legs in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. And then they were being taken advantage of sometimes. That's right. Um, can you remember, what? The camp, do you remember when they started building the camp and then um, the, how, the, how the camp seemed to fill up? With, can you describe that, how the camp became more and more populated, the camps? I suppose that the camps... Um, oh, I'm sorry, we have to cut for a second because we're... Steve? Okay. Um, I guess what the the camps filled up, got more and more populated. Can you do you have an impression of what 
Uh, my rather general impression is that as um, a few people started building, scavenging to find materials to build, and built little hovels, more of the people who, uh, I think when they first came to Washington, some of them were able to find cheap rooms to stay in. But their money was going fast, whatever money they had. And uh, I think that as the word spread, uh, more and more people just began scavenging and finding what they could do to put up a little hovel to stay in. Now, um, I think some of your pictures should show that, that some of the people had uh, trailers. I think there were a few trailers. But it, uh, my impression is that it was just a matter of word of mouth, that um, they found this was a better place to be. And there was uh, a sense of solidarity in being with the rest of the bonus people. Um, do you have any um, recollections of sights, sounds, smells of this camp? What, did it, what was it like as a sensory experience? I think the friend and I, who went with me and I, felt they did a very good job of policing it to keep it clean. Now when, when um, rains came and things got muddy, it was awful, just awful. I don't have much recollection of that, but I do remember seeing it one day when they were wallowing in mud. But they were clean and uh, some of the bonus families uh, tried to trim up their uh, little areas with rocks and, as I mentioned, plants and so on. Um, they were pretty enterprising, weren't they? We thought they were enterprising and I, uh, I don't have any recollection of talking with the leaders to know what was done to um, inspire people. Uh, but. I guess desperation was the main motivation. There was nothing else for them to do when they lost homes, lost their homes and had no money. Um, I, was, I was wondering uh, about Pelham Glasser. You, you said that you had seen him from afar. What was your impression? Yeah, yeah. Hold for a second. Speed. Um, can you... Give me your impressions of Pelham Glassford. I have a very vivid impression of Pelham Glassford. And uh, in a situation where there were some people you wished were not there, I wished he was with the bonus people all the time because he seemed to have sympathy for them and seemed to want them to get along as favorably as they could. When I say favorably, I mean favorably in the eyes of the press that was reporting all this. Um, he was a very tall, gangly man, uh, good looking. Uh, I remember him most vividly when he was not wearing a uniform. He used to ride around on a motorcycle with, uh, in, I think he wore tweeds and a slouching cap. And um, he was always very casual in, uh, as we saw him from a distance, talking with the bonus people. He often had a pipe in his mouth. Um, he was low keyed and I think that that was a part of his intention to try to keep the lid on what might have erupted, might have produ uh, produced a, an ugly picture of the uh, bonus people. Um, so can, can you um, give me your impressions of Pelham Glasser? Yes, he made a very strong impression on me, all, all favorable. First, he was seemed to be sympathetic with the bonus marchers, and he seemed to be eager to make their plight as, as pleasant as he could for them. Um, I never talked with him. Uh, I admired him from a distance. He was always riding around on a motorcycle. And you could see him from a distance chatting with some of the leaders, with some of the um, individuals. Um, he was a tall, gangly man, um, very good looking. And uh, my, as I try to call up the image of him right now, 
I see a very casual man, um, tall and good looking, who rode around on his motorcycle. Uh, we're going to stop there because you could tell, right? Um, Mrs. Benedict, when, um, I wondered if you could uh, tell me again how you'd, how you'd go and visit the veterans. Well, there were several, there were several ways we visited the, and talked with the veterans. Um, the, I think we talked with veterans more around the Capitol during the march than we did in their own little huts. Um, that's where the action was. Um, we'd go and find there was a, if there was a wall to sit on near the Capitol or some, a step to sit on, we'd sit, just pick out a family and go and sit with them and, and fall into conversation. And um, we observed, uh, the, of course we were concerned about families little children. <clears throat> and we noticed that um, ministers gathered around. Um, I remember one minister, I even remember his name, who moved from one bonus marcher to another, gave his name, the name of his church, and said, I hope you'll come to church on Sunday. We were rather contemptuous of him because they didn't need to go to church as much as they needed food and so on. Um, during the last days of the march, it was a hot weather, and some of the men were barefoot, barefoot and their feet were bleeding. Um, I think we didn't find it difficult to find some common ground with these people, and particularly with, when we paid attention to the children, the parents approved of that, because it must have been a dull bore for the children how they were able to behave so well, I guess is still a miracle to me. Um, can, you, can you talk about the, the um, well, would, would you describe the, the bonus, um, the death march for me? Um, what were they doing there? Um, why were they there? I think this was a, um, a desperate move. They'd been here for some time and Congress was um, about to disband for the summer, and they hoped there would be action in Congress. As I understand it, the House had, had uh, passed a measure, but the Senate had not. And they, they were tr kept trying to think up new ways to make an impression. Um, as I recall where it was done, it was right in front of the Capitol. And, um, a lot of people involved, mostly men, but as I remembered, occasionally women and children got in the line. The thing we couldn't forget was that uh, the pavement was so hot, and with these bare feet, it must have been a very painful thing. Um, Wait a minute. Uh, when you were watching the, um, the death march go on, where, where were you sitting? I have a vague recollection that there was a wall somewhere in front of the Capitol building. I haven't been around the Capitol for so many years, so I couldn't, it's pretty dim in memory. Okay. Um, when, the, the bonus, when the death march was going on, uh, where, were you, where were you? Right in, when the death march was, going on. We were right in front of the Capitol talking with the people, um, concerned about the men whose feet were getting sore on the hot pavements, and we talked with some of the families. Um, I remember one family, we'd just, we'd just look over the people we saw, and if they looked friendly, we'd sit down and talk with them. One family, uh, husband and wife, rather young people, I would guess, and they're mid-30s, with a little girl who was five or six years old. And we first started talking with them about uh, what sites they had seen in Washington, and they didn't have much time 
to go around because they were um, concerned with the bonus march. And we struck up a, a very friendly relationship, and so then my friend and I began asking them if they would like to go home with us. They had told us that they had run out of money, they had 50 cents left, they had spent, I guess, a quarter for milk for the little girl that morning. They had been staying in a cheap room, but they'd have to leave the room because they had no more money to pay for it. So we asked them if they wouldn't come home and have dinner with us. Said, uh, and she, the wife said to me that she so much wanted a bath. So they took some persuading because they were quite proud. The man was a, a professional photographer and his, his, he had just had to give up his, his business had melted away and his job was lost and they'd given up their home. Um, had to give up their home. Um, could you start that again with the man was a professional photographer? Don't forget to, to sort of look at Eric. Sometimes I think you're looking That's over right. the lens. Don't for, you just forget the lens. Okay. Start where? Uh, the man was a, uh, he tried to persuade them to come home. Oh. A very friendly family that we fell into conversation with had told us that they didn't have any money. They had 50 cents. They had spent everything else on milk for their little girl in a cheap room, but they would have to leave the room. That They had left the room and had no place to stay. So we began persuading them to go home with us. The wife had told me she so much wanted a bath, and they had pawned every, practically everything they owned. So. Th they finally agreed to come home with us. And uh, we stopped and bought a couple of boxes of chicken and we had some vegetables at home and other things. And, but before we had dinner, we asked them if they would like to take a shower. And I, as I remembered, each one of them took a shower. Meanwhile. So, um, Ms. Benedict, tell me about that family. This was a, one of the very friendly families we had encountered and learning some of their problems, we asked them if they wouldn't like to come home and have dinner with us. Um, the wife had said she so much wanted a shower. So we finally took them home and um, stopped and bought a couple of boxes of chicken and we had some food in the refrigerator, some vegetables and ice cream. And while they were taking, we asked each of them if they didn't want to take a shower. So while they were taking showers, we got the dinner on it, and my friend and I were rummaging around in our dresser drawers to see what we could produce. And I can remember the wife had told me she had only one brassiere, so I produced a couple of brassieres. We were about the same size, and we found some hose we were willing, hosiery we were willing to give up, and we found her a dress. We didn't have anything, the little girl could wear, which made her a little unhappy. And they settled down to dinner. They did not eat greedily, and we knew they hadn't eaten all day. It turned out to be a very pleasant and rewarding evening for us, and I think they went away a little more heartened, partly because um, one of the beaux who was with us that night, who had money, and my friend and I didn't have much money, he prevailed on them to take, I think it was a $10 bill, so they would have a little bit to go on the next day. Um, I wish I knew now what had happened to that family, because they were very decent, fine people. The, the bonus marches in general were, how would you describe them? I imagine there were all sorts of people in that bonus march. Um, there must have been, I know that, that they were very well, all of them were well behaved. If there, were, if there was violence or improper behavior, I didn't see it. Um, there were a lot of what I would call middle class people. Um, there may have been some people who at one time had been very rich, um, quite rich. But they, there was a sort of a leveling process as these people got together, and there was a sense of solidarity and a sense of responsibility to give a good account of themselves. Okay, that's fine. Let's go back to the um, Could you tell me um, that part of the story where you're after you had given the clothing? We were, I think we were all concerned. There was not only my female friend who with me had gone on all these expeditions, but 
one of our bows was with us that evening. And uh, we, we wished we could give, give them some money, but we didn't have very much money. And our bow prevailed upon them. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so um, could you tell me what happened after the close? We wish that we could give them some money because they were out of money except for the 50 cents they had. And, but we didn't have much money and we were stripping our, our minor uh, clothing ward wardrobes. Um, but uh, one of our bows was with us that evening and he prevailed upon uh, the photographer, the husband, to take a $10 bill, which made us f feel a lot better. They were such decent, fine people. I wish that I knew now what had happened to them. Thanks. Hey. There were a lot of um, rumors going around at this time, um, you know, about who these marches were. Um, what kind of rumors were there? I have rather v vague recollections of rumors I heard, but I, I did hear some, and I think the rumors that, that made the most impression on me were the rumors of radicalism among the um, bonus marchers. Um, communist influences were mentioned. Um, people who were, might be willing to incite violence if they didn't get the bonus awarded as they were trying to do. Um, and the press, as I, I don't remember much about what was in the press. Actually, we were so busy uh, putting all the waking hours we could in the talks with the bonus people that I don't know that I read a lot of newspaper reports at that time. Um, but that was one of the fears. Now, whether um, snobbish people thought it was a bad thing to Washington to uh, give an inch of ground to these desperate people, I don't know, but that must have existed. Um, just like as of today, when you see so many homeless people begging on the streets, some people are horrified and say they ought to be put in jail. But there were rumors and um, exactly what the role of the press was, I, I wouldn't have a very clear impression. Um, okay. I, I would like to ask you um, what you thought you saw, what you thought you saw unfolding in front of you. I think We thought we saw unfolding before us as day after day we saw these people was the possibility of a great tragedy. We couldn't, we talked a little bit about it. What, how is all this going to end? If Congress gave them the bonus as they were demanding, um, or if Congress didn't, what would happen? I think this was the thing that concerned us most. Um, were some of these people who were really desperate going to turn to violence? What was going to happen? Um, I do, I think that, that somebody provided funds to help them get out of town after congressional action was not taken and the Senate action was not taken. And that probably did a lot to avoid real trouble. Now the Senate, the Congress closed on that. Come on. Okay. The Congress closed and uh, adjourned in on in the middle of June, but the veterans lingered on. Um, why did they, what was their purpose then? What happened? I'm not sure that I know what these people who stayed be, stayed on in Washington had in mind. Um, because from our conversations with people, they just okay, thought, we're blown away. yeah. Um, can you describe Pelham Glasser to me? I have a very vivid memory of Pelham Glassford, always from a distance. I never talked with him. Um, 
He moved so easily among the bonus marchers. He was a tall, good-looking, gangly man um, who was very casual in every movement he made. He was often smoking a pipe, riding around on his motorcycle. Um, most of the times I saw him, he was not in uniform, just wearing um, shabby tweeds and a slouchy cap with a pipe in his mouth. Um, I had the feeling that he did a lot to keep things from getting out of hand because he was talking not only with the leaders but with the individual bonus marchers. And he was clearly sympathetic with them and did what he could to make their plight as easy as possible. Um, I thought he was, at the time, I thought he was one of the heroes of this experience. And I didn't know all the heroes. But he must have done a good job with some of the leaders because I do remember that after Congress adjourned with no action on the bonus, uh, he was some of the leaders, and uh, there, was, there were some fears that they would turn to violence if Congress didn't act. And apparently that night he, with the help of the leaders, diverted some of the crowds to um, an area we did not go to for a meeting where I believe he spoke. Could you tell me about that, that night in the Senate, that last night? The last night in the Senate was, a, to me, a very dramatic happening. Here were these men, the senators, who had terrific power over the hundreds and thousands of bonus people. Terrific power. They could make their lives easier or they could say, no, we don't care about you. And of course, my sympathies were wholly with the bonus people at that point. Um, I'm not sure whether there was a filibuster going on. I have a vague recollection there was, and I do remember seeing Huey Long in his beautiful, expensive clothing, pacing up and down in the Senate and talking about very little that had to do with the bonus. Uh, that's why I think it may have been a filibuster. Um, but it was a dramatic moment. Um, there were some of the bonus marchers had got into the galleries that we had, and um, you could just see faces falling all over the place because no action had been taken, and they were pinning their hopes as a last-minute ploy on the part of the Senate. It didn't happen. Okay, let's cut for a second. We're all so, um, Mrs. Benedict, could you tell me of the last night in the Senate? You better. The last evening in the Senate, before the Senate adjourned for, for summer, was quite dramatic. My friend and I were in the gallery, and we could spot bonus marchers around, some bonus marchers around in the galleries, just avidly waiting for, hoping that before the Senate adjourned, sometime around 11 at night, or perhaps even close, closer to midnight, hoping it would, that they would act to give the bonus to these marchers when they wanted it. Oh, okay, let's, let, can we start it again? Because uh, the march is the bonus. What? Yeah, I'll, um, it's a wrap. So can you tell me about the uh, last night in the Senate? The last night in the Senate was very dramatic. Um, the Senate was going to disband for the summer. And in the galleries where I was sitting and where a number of, we could spot bonus marchers also sitting in the galleries waiting to see what happened. My most vivid impression of that evening was seeing Huey, Senator Huey Long speaking vehemently on the floor of the Senate and walking up, pacing up and down as he did. And when the Senate was declared disbanded, I think they say sine die. The bonus people we saw in the galleries just looked so sad. You could just see faces falling all around you. And that was their last great hope. So I consider that one of the dramatic parts of the bonus experience. 
Um, I'm going to move on now to the to the night of the the row. Um, uh, hold, let's cut for a second. What's our foot? That's that's um, me. You know, I I think it's made an impression on you that's deep. So what what? How important was seeing this? I consider my acquaintance with the bonus marchers one of the important experiences of my lifetime. Um, I thought I considered myself a student of government, and I was curious about how Congress was going to handle this. And of course, they disappointed me. I didn't care a bit about the economics of it, whether it was unwise to pay the bonus earlier than had been contracted in the original legislation. I cared only about these people. And perhaps a part of it was that um, my own family had very difficult times in the Depression. My father was just wiped out in the Depression. And uh, my mother had to take in boarders for a while in order to feed us. Um, I did learn that um, for reasons that are n still not wholly clear to me, that government then showed its seamy side. Um, there was, on the one hand, where the, the Congress with the power to make or break some of these people, there was a president who sat in his well-guarded White House. The streets were cut off, were taped off. From <laughs> you, you completely were on. Um, could you, could you tell me what it, what you saw that night you walked out of the Senate? I remember walking down that long flight of steps, and seeing hundreds, maybe thousands of crowds milling about. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you start again? Uh, thousands of people in the, in the crowds. The, just, just start again. You remember walking down? No. I remember walking down that long flight of steps in the Senate building and seeing thousands of people milling about crowds on the steps, at the foot of the steps, in the, on the green, on the grass in front of the building. I think there was probably a sense of great confusion. What in the world do I do now? I come all the way from California or Arkansas to try to get the bonus awarded so I can feed my kids, and Senate hasn't done anything about it. What do we do now? I remember seeing Pelham Glassford in the distance talking with some of the leaders, and a long, earnest conversation. And we heard rumors that what he was trying to do was to convince the leaders that they all ought to adjourn to a field somewhere else, somewhere in Washington, where they would have a meeting and somebody would make speeches. He was going to talk to the crowd. Um, I don't remember just what happened after that, but uh, a sense of, of lost hope, desperation, fear, concern, everything you can think of was very obvious in the, in the crowds milling about, wondering what to do. Great, thank you. Let's cut. Can you tell me what how you heard about Anacostia that last night and what you saw? As I remember that dramatic evening when Anacostia was set ablaze by the authorities, by order of the authorities, to oust the bonus marchers, as I remember it, um, we had spent part of the day talking to the bonus people, um, had gone home to have some dinner. And um, one of our friends who was, had been with us several times either phoned us or we heard on radio that um, Anacostia had been set fire. And a friend did phone us and say, let's go. So we jumped into a car and rushed down there. Uh, we approached the bridge over the 
river that you'd have to cross to get to Anacostia. And you couldn't possibly get across that bridge. There were 15 uh, cavalry policemen lined up on their horses facing us. I think we've got us. So tell me what happened as you, as you got out. As we came to, as we approached the bridge over the river to Anacostia, you couldn't possibly get across that bridge because there were 15 cavalry policemen lined up, their horses facing us as we approached, standing stock still. Um, crowds were behind us. They wanted to get over. Some of the people were bonus people whose belongings, few belongings they had, were in flames at Anacostia. It was rather difficult because the police were trying to push the crowds, including us, back away from the bridge and this incredible sight of 15 stock still horses and horsemen. Um, we duck into doorways and uh, hope that they wouldn't notice us, and we were doing pretty well. But then they began throwing tear gas, and that was a little hairy. So just As we approached... Start again. I, I stepped in your words. Be back here. What? I stepped in your words. I spoke over your words. Oh. As we approached the bridge over the river, which you have to cross to get to Anacostia, we were stopped by the dramatic sight of 15 cavalry policemen lined up tight across that bridge, the horses' flanks touching horses' flanks, policemen and horses not moving a muscle. And behind them, you could see flames leaping up to the sky as Anacostia camp of the marchers burned. Um, behind us were people trying to get to the bridge. I, have to assume that a good many of them were bonus. So, um, tell me what, tell me what you saw um, after you, when you started to approach this bridge. As we faced the Anacostia Bridge, that you have to cross to get to the Anacostia Field, where the campers, where the bonus people had their camp, we were faced with 15 cavalry policemen shutting off access to the bridge, standing flank to flank, these immo immobile horses and immobile horsemen. Um, and behind them, in flaming in the sky, we could see Anacostia bonus camp just going up in, in flames and smoke. It was a very dramatic sight. And behind us, we realized, began to realize, there were other people there were a lot of people who were trying to get to the bridge. Probably the bonus people whose belongings, what belongings they had were being burned up. And then the policemen began pushing the crowds, including us, away from the bridge. And we tried to stay as close as possible to the bridge and the horsemen um, by ducking into doorways and we were being pretty successful. We didn't go back with the crowd the police were pushing, but eventually they began throwing tear gas, and we thought that was pretty hairy. We thought we'd just have to get out of that. So when a streetcar came along, we jumped on the streetcar, and the motorman was driving through that um, tear gas area with tears streaming down his face, and we finally got through the bad area and were found our car and left. That was one of the most dramatic sights I've ever seen in my life. The, the horsemen on the bridge and the flames in the sky. Um, how did you, you also looked at the White House that night. What did you think when you looked at the White House? <laughs> okay. When we drove away from there, we passed an area not far from the White House, but we couldn't get near the White House because President Hoover was so carefully guarded, the streets were blocked, and policemen were, several policemen, quite a few policemen in every part of the, that area. Um, we were wishing 
that this I think we should stop. I'm sorry to yeah. um, You also passed the White House, right? Also yes, we, we passed the White House where President Hoover was being carefully guarded, streets blocked off, policemen everywhere. And we wish that this man, who had done such a splendid job of re doing relief work in Europe after World War I, would apply some of that compassion he showed then to the bonus marchers. We wished he would go out of the White House and go down and talk with the bonus people. It would have done wonders. But of course, presidents don't do that. There was always, always fear of he would be harmed. But we did not have much use for President Hoover that night, I must confess. How did you, how did you feel about the country? What did you think about America? on that night? I guess that evening's experience um, made me feel as I had been tempted to feel that the richest country in the world was doing a lousy job of taking care of its own. Who did you blame? Can, can you re repeat that question? Because there was an error. I sort of talked over there. I was trying to stop it because there was a noise. Um, how did you feel about America that night? I think I was very unhappy about my native land that night. Um, it, what had gone on reinforced my feeling that it was too bad that the richest country in the world couldn't do a better job of caring for its own people, particularly people who had gone off to war and subjected themselves to danger in order to help the country. It was believed to help the country. I wish that I didn't think much of our President Hoover at that time either. He was so carefully guarded, with streets blocked off around him and policemen everywhere. I wish that that President, who had done such a beautiful job of relief work in Europe after World War I, would show the same compassion for his own people. I just thought America didn't give a very good account of itself that night. Does that do? Yes, very well. Tell, tell me why you were so interested in these bonus people. I am guessing that one reason I was so interested in the bonus people is that my family had difficult times in the Depression years. I graduated from college in 1928, came home to my family. I was lucky enough to find a job, and more than half my salary went to my family because my father had just um, been hard hit by the Depression. He had no job. He was a chemical engineer. Um, we were able to eat, go on eating, because my mother took in boarders. Um, then when I came, to, I came to Washington in 1930. We're getting wiped out. What happened for you, <laughs> for, for you and your family as the, as, um, the country experienced after the crash? Mm -hmm. So could, could you tell me that, how, how, you, how you experienced the crash? Are we on now? Yes. I was well acquainted with some of the difficult effects of the Depression. My father was hard hit in the Depression, and I had five brothers and sisters. I was number two, so there were five of us at home, and we were able to eat because my mother took in boarders. I came to Washington in 1930, and things got more and more difficult. Uh, the Depression couldn't, wasn't over with in a hurry. I can remember that I had 50 cents a day to eat on. I was sending every penny I could home. And um, one reason, I, I, one way I could save money was that there was a government-sponsored restaurant, may have, could have been a WPA restaurant sometime in the early 30s, where you could get a stand-up dinner for seven cents. Meat was five cents, and each vegetable was two cents. 
so I could get some dinners at seven cents a day. Um, well, just could you start out again and, and say, um, and talk about how the country, how it seemed the Depression came on for you? That maybe at first you didn't, weren't quite sure what was happening. Okay, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm, 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 what was the atmosphere like around the, the Capitol during the Death March? The, the Capitol area during this set. So what was the atmosphere around the Capitol during the Death March? The atmosphere around the Capitol building was very strange during the Death March. It was weird. Um, there was not much noise. <clears throat> Maybe the people didn't have enough energy to make a lot of noise, but they were quiet and well behaved. Um, there was a, a sense of, of sadness, of desperation, which I can't forget. Um, the bonus marchers themselves um, didn't make much noise. It maybe they didn't have enough energy because they were putting it all forth, uh, putting all, forth all their energies into the march, and there were families sitting around near where the marchers marched, and the families looked grim. It was just somber, and it was very unnatural. Human beings just don't behave this way in normal circumstances. Is that okay? okay? That's great. That's